Hello and welcome everyone. This is Sabrina Paganoli. I'm giving everyone a few seconds to join from the waiting room. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Mary Sukovic, the PI of the HILA ELS platform trial. I'm also here with our patient navigation team, Alison Bulat and Catherine Small. And thank you, Jesse, for supporting the, uh, the operations of this. So I see people are joining. So I think we, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we, we wanted to share a QR code and a couple of links uh, for those of you who may be new uh, to the platform trial, or also for those of you who want to get more information and, and share the information with uh, friends and family. Uh, we do have a dedicated uh, website uh, for the Healy Center uh, and also a specific platform trial page where there is a for patients page. Uh, again, you can find the link uh, on, on the slide. And so if you, um, if you ever want to share information or uh, get more information about the trial, you can always do that on our website as well. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, as discussed in previous uh, webinars here, the goal of the trial is to screen drugs rapidly and efficiently. We want to get solid answers and determine next steps. So there's been a lot of news in the recent um, weeks about ALS. So we just wanted to summarize a few of them here and also share some links for previous uh, webinars. Um, uh, on our webpage, we also have uh, links to recordings, uh, different webinars, different uh, educational videos. So if you also want to go deeper into these, um, um, you know, the recent news, uh, you know, you can always find the information there. Next slide. So again, uh, over the last month or so, uh, ALS has really been in the news with the approval of AMX 35 at the end of September. Uh, and then from, uh, from uh, the point of view of the platform trial, also a number of news. Um, and uh, we had uh, the Regimen B top line results. Also on September 29th, uh, we uh, announced that we received funding for an EAP for one of the regimens, as well as released um, top line results for Regimen C. Next slide. And what we found was that, unfortunately, the first uh, couple of regimens, as you know, were stopped and it was clear negative answer. Uh, and that was announced previously. Um, and, and when we announced regimen C top line results, uh, while um, the primary endpoint was not met, there was a survival signal. And for that reason, regimen C uh, open level extension and the expanded access program for regimen C is continuing. Next slide. And again, I'm really summarizing this today uh, in just a few uh, sentences because uh, we, we, re we released all of these in greater detail in previous webinars. Again, the QR code and the link can bring you to the full length webinars also because every week we want to save time for your questions. So uh, again, I'm just summarizing uh, previous news uh, and, and sharing the, the recordings with you so that you can um, go deeper into that if you want, but also we want to leave time for questions today. Next slide. Now, speaking about the regimen that's actually um, enrolling new participants right now, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes because this could be sort of, you know, interesting information for some of you who may be new uh, and may be interested in joining the trial as a participant. So, uh, so right now we are enrolling for one regimen, that's regimen E, that's testing triolos that's made uh, by Silos Therapeutics. Uh, and, and, and this drug has an interesting mechanism of action working on mechanisms that are well known to be involved in ALS. Uh, specifically, it works on protein stabilization and autophagy. Uh, and the slide again summarizes uh, the, the main uh, mechanism of action of, of this drug. Uh, and that, that has rele relevance to ALS. And now we're testing it in the trial to see if given the drug can affect these mechanisms and specifically um, improve uh, ALS progression. Next slide. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll see that, uh, that, that we have explained um, these recordings, um, these, these um, me the mechanism of action, uh, as well as more information on the slide, I think it's shown right now. So we, 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 have, we gave a recording, we gave a webinar on the mechanism of action of the drug, that's the one on the left, and also Dr. Sukovic and Dr. Lada, who are the co-lead investigators of the, this regimen, also provided some practical information for people with ALS who may be interested in joining uh, Regimen E. And so again, all of this is available on our website. Next slide. We are currently enrolling at 57 sites. There's been a few more sites that have been 
activated for this regimen. And so every week we provide an updated list and map. And again, we're happy that uh, since we last spoke, we have a few more regimens that have been activated. So uh, we continue to expand the network. Uh, and if you have any questions about sites, uh, where to find the trial, uh, you can find um, that information on our website or also contact our patient navigators who are here with, on the call with us. Next slide. And for our traditional uh, enrollment updates, uh, I'm glad to report that we continue to make uh, progress on regimen E. So uh, we target about 160 individuals per regimen and, and, and people have to first sign an informed consent to join the regimen. Uh, and, and the ma majority of people uh, is, uh, is generally found to be eligible, but some people cannot join the trial due to eligibility criteria. So we have screened about 160 individuals, but again, some uh, may uh, have been found ineligible for the trial and some may still be in screening. Uh, and right now uh, of those individuals, 121, have already been randomized within regimen E and, and a few more are in screening. So certainly great progress on this regimen, but we also would really like uh, to complete the enrollment soon. So, so thank you to all of you who are already participating. And if you have um, interest in participating or if you know someone who may be interested, please um, connect them with our patient navigator or, or the sites because uh, we would like to enroll to complete enrollment as soon as possible. Once we do that, then we can move on to the next phase which is basically following uh, all participants uh, and, and then finally getting to the results. Next slide. And again, we are always available uh, outside of this webinar and, and specifically I'm, I'm grateful that Alison and Catherine are here and also available to connect with you outside of the webinar series. Uh, we do have an upcoming cancellation for Thanksgiving because just obviously uh, this, this is on Thursday, uh, but we, have, um, we will have webinars the rest of the month. And so with that, I think we can um, stop sharing the slides um, and we can take questions. And I'm glad that um, we had Dr. Sukovic here for, for your questions. Um, nice so, you thank you. So question about future regimens. What other regimens are we, be gonna, are we going to offer after uh, um, regimen E? Oh, yeah, we're, we're hoping to start three new regimens in 2023. Um, we've... Um, contracted with two companies and we've announced one of them and that's Calico. Calico is um, a company that is currently uh, completing a phase one trial. So a safety dose finding study in people with ALS. And we've been working with them on the design of their regimen, regimen F uh, in the platform trial. And we're hoping uh, that they will start enrolling in Q uh, in the first half of 2023. We're hoping they'll be in the earlier half of the half, but that's our current timeline. Great, thank you. And um, there's a question about the news conference that happened last week. Um, and someone is asking if there's anything new from that conference. It was a fantastic conference. I'll, I'll say, I guess nothing better like not seeing each other for three years and then everybody getting back together. But it was fantastic for more than for the for that. Uh, it was really a, um, a partnership of you know scientists, um, our research ambassadors, um, the clinicians and everybody at the centers who cares for people with ALS coming together. We had um, you know updates on the the trials that um, Niels is running, um, including you know the Niels affiliated studies like the Trafersen trial that's um, you know under FDA review now. We we updated on the Amlex and the Platform trial, um, the new um, Himalaya study from Sanofi. Um, we had a great session on science and technology, and then we had a two day. Um, uh, Clinical Research Learning Institute that Rick Bedlack led and with Allison and others. We had a couple, you know, patient um, or people with ALS panels that were really uh, inspiring and informative. And it was, it was a really great meeting. Great. There's a couple of questions about when we will get more results. So, so far we have only shared the top line results. Uh, I don't know if you can explain a little bit more about what top line results are and when do we expect biomarkers? Yeah, so top line results are really just the primary and key secondaries, and that we can do, um, you know, when we've locked the database and and um, and uh, you know the initial analyses. But there's so much more. It's all our exploratory, our subgroup, everything we've written in something called a SAP or a statistical analysis plan. For regimen B, uh, for Tipistat, they had made a decision early on that they were only going to use shared placebo data from regimen A and C. 
so for um, for regimen B, we, we've been actively working on all those additional analyses. And I, I hope, you know, maybe we haven't exactly set the time, but we're, we're almost done with all those. So I hope by the end of the year or so, we'll be able to share the rest of the um, regimen B results. And obviously we're going to be writing a paper. No matter what the results, we got to publish everything so nobody duplicates and, and we can share everything. Regimen A and C, and D had all decided to share up uh, data from people on um, assigned to placebo from all three, all four regimens. And so to complete all the detailed analysis, we need um, a regimen D to be finished and locked. And that's why we, we only presented top line results for A and C. Um, and uh, that's happening soon. I, I think we'll have more results for the end of the year in early 2023. Um, and it'll come out in, in, I think, pieces as we get the data. Great, thank you. And another question about timelines. Um, when do we expect results from the trial that's ongoing right for the regimen that's enrolling right now, regimen E? Well, um, I, it all depends on enrollment. I think uh, so. What, what the study goes until the last participant enrolled finishes their six month visit or the twenty four week visit, um, and then it obviously takes us a little bit of time to um, lock the database and, and make sure the data is all ready for the analysis. So. For example, if if enrollment finished in, in early January, then six months later is June, and you know uh, probably the summer to to do all the analysis and clean up. So, well, as soon as we know when the last person enrolls, we can set all those timelines. Great. There's a couple of questions about the EAP um, and specifically the Trialos EAP. So maybe I'm happy to take that. So yes, in terms of the Trialos EAP. Um, that's funded by um, uh, a, a grant from the NIH, and I'm really happy to work on, on, on this with uh, Copi uh, Dr. Barry and Dr. Babu, uh, and others um, that are helping, you know, with the operation. So we are setting this up right now, uh, and uh, we expect up to 25 sites to participate. So there will be essentially a group of sites that's part of that uh, group of sites that's actually participating in Regimen E. And so we uh, we sent a questionnaire uh, asking for interest to all sites. Uh, and, and um, you know, so all sites were given the opportunity. Some sites uh, have more capacity, more bandwidth in terms of um, availability of coordinators, et cetera. And so we uh, we are selecting sites, again, based on, on their um, capabilities and, and also geographically, we want it to be, uh, you know, to have all regions represented. Uh, so question, um, there's a question here um, about, uh, let me see, uh, about uh, the cost of the drug, uh, if you are in the trial, can you address, is there any cost to participating in the trial or the open label extension? There's no cost to the participant of the study medication that's provided by the, um, the company that's making it. Um, there obviously are costs to doing the study and, um, and that's covered also by the company, but the participant themselves don't pay for the drug. Um, Great. Which is good. Yeah. So, question about um, the, the infusion for regimen E. So, re regimen E is an intravenous infusion. Uh, and the question is can somebody use a port for infusions? Is that better than regular infusions? Can you comment on that? Yeah, we're very flexible. People can use, if they have a port and they want to use a port, um, they can do that. If they don't have a port and want to put one in, we, uh, they can do that. Or if they prefer just to do um, do it by um, uh, in, uh, like an IV once a week. Um, the infusion takes um, between one and two hours, depending on, on someone's weight. It's weight-based. So I, I would say that most participants are really just choosing to do it uh, once a week with an IV. And I, I am very... I'm very excited about the home nursing service that we were partnered with. This is the first study um, I've been part of where we've been able to give ex experimental treatments in people's home uh, with the nursing service. So, um, and you know, it hasn't been 100% perfect, but it's been 95% perfect. And there is a nationwide shortage of nurses, but it's it's gone really well. It's allowed people to get the drug after the first four weeks in their in their home setting. So, if, if someone is uh, using continuous BiPAP or continuous NIV, um, I believe the, the question is, you know, day and night, would they be eligible for this trial or for any other trial? That's a good question. So for um, if for the platform trial, the requirement is that the breathing function is uh, more than 50% of predicted. Um, and so um, probably if somebody's using BiPAP, uh, 
you know, most of the day, most of the night, their their breathing function is probably less than that, and they wouldn't be eligible. Um, and and most studies have that type of cutoff. Some are sixty percent, some are fifty. But expanded access programs often do not have that cutoff, and that would be something worth talking about with your um, neurologist. Great. There's a couple of comments, not questions. I'm very happy that you wrote um, to, you know, so thank you so much for the uh, regimen E participants who commented that they love the home treatment and somebody else said that the home vendor PCM has been very good to the to work with. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. And so in terms of the uh, expanded access for regimen E, um, so um, the question is, when will sites be announced? Um, so we're going to do it over the next few weeks. We are literally working with the sites as we speak, uh, communicating with them, confirming that they want to participate and confirming that, again, they, they, they can do it operationally. So uh, really practically speaking, you know, all the contracts, et cetera. So I expect that we will, you know, um, be able to communicate very soon, uh, probably just give us a few weeks just to make sure that we can finalize the list and make sure that everyone has the resources and, and all the contract can go can go well. But we expect to enroll uh, in starting enrolling in early 2023 um, in, in the first quarter, probably February, March, I would imagine. Uh, and then um, we will start with, you know, the first sites to be activated and then kind of have them join um, as, as you know as soon as possible as they uh, all these administrative um, kind of uh, procedures uh, you know get completed so there's a few questions about uh, other trials not necessarily the platform trial so can you give us any updates there's a few questions I'm just gonna take them here in general there's you know prime C neuron questions about transposome can you give us some updates? Sure. I mean, the, the exciting thing is that there's an, a, so many trials going on, not, you know, not just in the U.S., but really all over the world. Um, I can talk about a few of them. Uh, Prime C is by a company, Neurosense. They are doing a, what I would call like a phase two, early phase two trial that started in, in Israel, um, but, um, and is enrolling uh, participants, and they are uh, going to expand to other countries as well. Uh, in a moderate-sized study to look at uh, dosing biomarkers, initial safety. Um, Transposa is a study, um, actually I'll back up. So Prime-C is um, the, the idea, is they're, they're, the, it's a combination of two drugs that work on um, what we call RNA biology, so how proteins are made. And they have some good preclinical models that those drugs in combination are helpful. Um, but this is really their second study in people, but the first one that's kind of, uh, I would say, a rigorous, you know, double blind trial. Um, Transposon is um, a very small study um, in ALS, um, as well as um, um, a different illness uh, movement disorder. And they are looking um, at this point um, only in people who carry the gene mutation for C9. Um, and that um, the study is actively enrolling. And this is based on this idea of something called retrotransposons, where parts of the genetic material um, jump from one area to another, and, and uh, therefore you get proteins made uh, badly. Um, and so this might be something that could be appropriate also for sporadic disease, and we're definitely talking to them about next steps. Um, the Himalaya study that was just started in the U.S., this is a um, we just did a webinar on Niels last night about it, Dr. Otasi and myself, to share a little bit about the science, and that should be recorded on the webinar. But this is a, a drug called a RIPK1 inhibitor, um, and that so blocks um, both a, a process by how cells die called necrop necroptosis, as well as inflammation. And that's a phase two study looking at safety and efficacy. There, anyway, that's just a few. There's a lot. Yeah. Great. And, and there's, a, again, a few more questions about EAPs. So specifically, do is there an EAP for transposome? Uh, no, there isn't. And I would say um, that's a very early, um, like I would say it's a phase 2A study. It's just, a, and then I forgot if it's 24 or 30 people, very small number of people looking at dose biomarker safety. Um, and uh, often EAPs come later after, either when you're late in phase 2 or when you're in phase 3. There's an excellent question about how can how do people choose between trials? And somebody actually commented on the webinar that uh, they listened to the webinar 
last night that you gave about the Himalaya study and, and, and was a good webinar, uh, but then uh, they also like the platform trials. So um, how can someone choose between one or another? And, and the comment also, the question also says that the neurologist of this person is very good, but um, it doesn't, it's not particularly involved in research. So doesn't really know how to counsel this person about which trial to choose. Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I'd love to hear Sabrina's and Allison and Catherine's input too. I'll say that um, first, the way I kind of do is first is, okay, of all the trials available, which one might some, one of the people that I care for be eligible for? You know, and then, and then we go through the science and the visit schedule the route of administration and kind of see what what sounds good or what what that someone might might want, um, and it's really a dialogue between you know the neurologist and and the and the person with ALS about what 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 might be good, but we don't really know which one's better than the other. I mean, if we knew, then we wouldn't need the trial. Um, there are you know navigators, including two uh, that are here, Catherine and Allison, and and they would be people to reach out to that could tell you about what's going on, what's near your where you live. Um, we also have Judy Carey, who's um, a research nurse with us and works closely with Allison and Catherine that talks to people interested in trials. Uh, people don't have to be a Mass General uh, Hospital um, patient to talk to Judy. And there's also Carly uh, Allen at Niels. And they all work together, all four of you work together to try to share information. Right. I don't know, Sabrina, if, or anyone, or Allison or Catherine, if you have any pointers. I think um, separate from the science, Merritt, I think we encourage people to think about what it would take to participate in that trial. And can you get there easily? Is your caregiver able to take you to the appointments, the things that are going to happen during the trial? Are you comfortable with that? I think there are a lot of considerations outside of the science as well that people really should consider when selecting which trial. Yeah, and I, I love it that uh, we're getting um, uh, suggestions from the audience, uh, how uh, people, uh, you know, made that selection. So I think it's great that people commented that sort of, you know, um, the trial logistics are also important to your point, Alison, you know, wh where is it, um, you know, who is recruiting, uh, availability, uh, and also the OLE, et cetera. And I love the suggestion about also doing some research on the CDC website, and they have filters. Um, and, and I would say, you know, the CDC website, great website. There's also a few more websites like the News Consortium website or, or uh, other websites, uh, I, um, IMALS as a, as a signal uh, web page uh, again, and, and there are filters. That's also a very good suggestion. And thank you for to the person who suggested that, because then you can really filter by location, uh, you know, uh, and, and all of that. Great. So, um, Merit, a few questions about you know EAPs again. Um, so I believe so. The Trialos um, EAP is going to be available at the twenty five sites. I don't believe that it's available at other sites outside of this NIH grant. So that, there's another question about sort of you know can somebody um, you know, a community-based physician participate in, in an EAP? How can an uh, independent physician, I guess, um, make the request? Uh, yes, yeah, so any, any doctor can ask a company um, about um, access to their drug for an EAP. And um, and so that's really important. Now, um, it, the, F, the company might say yes, or they might say no. Let's, let's say they say yes, then the um, community doctor um, could fill out uh, a form, which actually the FDA has made pretty easy um, to request FDA permission, and then they need their local ethics uh, permission. And uh, Rick Bedlack and Sabrina uh, with, with Allison and Catherine have actually made uh, materials to help uh, neurologists on this, to give them templates for that, so it, to make it easier. Um, so it, it really, anyone can ask. The, the challenge is, is that I, I think pharma companies don't want to do 51 one-time uh, EAPs, and they'd rather this approach like what Sabrina's doing with uh, the NIH grant of 25 sites, standard protocol, and, and make it available to as many people as possible. So there's a question about eligibility in trials versus EAPs. So perhaps it may be helpful if you could explain. So if somebody qualifies for the platform trial or for other trials, would they be eligible for an EAP? Really good question. No, they wouldn't. So that the whole the whole goal really of the EAPs is to provide uh, experimental um, uh, drugs to to people who are not eligible for trials and um, and to do that um, in the same safe way, um, but not to uh, interfere with the ability to actually do the trial and tell if a drug works or not. 
actually, again, another great comment from a regimen E participant. Uh, the, the, this regimen E participant said, you know, I'm getting great care as a patient, as a participant in a trial, and it's actually the best thing that uh, this person did since diagnosis. And can, can you maybe comment on, on kind of care during trials? Um, I, th I think there, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, you know, um, I, I love seeing pe uh, um, people in trials because, um, you know, we see people for, they're there for a little bit for the visit. We, we might see someone every four weeks or eight weeks, depending on the trial, and you get a lot of time with the, um, the trial team. And, and um, there have been studies that show that people get better care who are uh, involved in clinical trials. So there's a question about Relivrio. Uh, now that it's approved, how it affects trials, which trials allow Relivrio? Yeah, uh, it, it's also another good problem to have. Um, so, so most uh, trials are allowing it. Um, what what trials are trying to do is is uh, ask that if people are going to take it, that they take it before starting the trial or wait until the open label extension, because if someone is in a trial in the double blind part and starts um, a new drug in the middle, it can make it very difficult to tell if that drug that's being studied works or not, especially if there's an imbalance. Let's say, um, let's say, let's say, for example, in regimen E, if um, everybody who perhaps is in the on the placebo, the 25%, they feel like they're not they're not doing well and they all go on relivrio, then um, we won't be able to tell if regimen E works because it'll shift the um, the curve. So we we try to ask people if they can to wait the six months. Let's say they're in month five, can they wait one month more and then start it in the open label extension? Great. We're getting a lot of questions tonight. I hope I took most of them, or if not all of them, or lumped them together, the ones that are similar. There's a question about when will people who were in Regimen A or other regimens find out if they were on placebo or active drug? It's a good question. I don't have the answer yet. And I'll tell you why you don't have the answer. It's very complex in a platform trial because, because we are still using the data from regimen A for um, the analysis for regimen um, B, C, and D. And while we're still doing those analysis, we cannot tell people who are in the study or, or the sites um, who was on what. Once we're um, completed using that data, then we could. Now, the complication of that in the platform trial is the whole goal of the platform trials to be able to, to continue to use um, the data. And so I don't have an answer yet. And believe it or not, despite all the platform trials out there in the world, there isn't uh, uh, um, like any great advice on this from the other networks. So we're trying to really think this through carefully and have a balance between doing the right thing for people who are in the trial, letting them know what they were on. and but maintaining the ability to have a, a robust platform trial and continue to use that data. So we will we will answer that question on this call, but we're still working that through. Great. Uh, I think we took most of the questions. Is the question about Verge Genomics, another company, do, do, can you comment on, on Verge Genomics? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a very interesting approach, a kind of AI-driven approach to find a target and find a drug. It's a big five inhibitor, and they're just starting um, a trial. Again, this is early days of uh, kind of safety and dose. I, I don't know whether it's going to work or not, but I think it's a new way to look for targets in uh, ALS that's exciting. Great. And there's another question again, again about transposome. Uh, is this only for people with genetic mutation, um, also in the other neurological disease? I actually no, don't. No, 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 it's, um, it's not. Yeah, it's just C9, ALS, and um, I, I believe PSP. I don't, I don't want to say that incorrectly, but yeah. I, I don't think it's just genetic. Okay. okay, great. So I think we took all the questions, and as always, great questions from the audience. And thank you for a number of comments also that were uh, shared with us. Um, Mary, do you want to um, to make any final remarks? Well, so thank you everybody for coming and great questions. And we will see you, I think, still next week. And then we'll, not on Thanksgiving, but thank you for joining us every week. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And, and again, feel free to reach out also outside the, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.